So you know that shot with the strap around the hand? You know, that controversial shot that we just can't seem to get over? Today we're getting to the bottom of it, and we're going straight to the source. Eric Sandin's here from What Effects, who was the visual effects supervisor on Avatar The Way of Water, and you brought with you some exclusive breakdown of the actual shot. Thanks to Native for sponsoring this video. Hey everyone, Jordan here, and I am super excited because today we have a very special, very long-awaited React episode. But before we get into that, I'm gonna tell you about today's sponsor, Native. Let's just cut to the chase. Native is my favorite deodorant. It's aluminum-free, it's cruelty-free, and they keep my pitch dry all day. And I mean all day. I put it on in the morning, I go to work all day, then I will go hit a Muay Thai class after work, and it's all good because it has a 72 hour odor protection. It's all good, it's all good. But that's not all. For one, my favorite is the texture. When you put it on, it's not sticky and it feels dry while applying. It smells amazing. So this one right here that I have in my hand is cucumber mint, but at home I have the coconut and vanilla. It smells so good. So normally, 3D deodorants would cost you $39, but right now, if you use our link and put in the code quarter crew, you can get 3D deodorants for $26. That's 33% off. But wait, there's more. If you use that same code, you'll also get 20% off of all body washes and lotions. Easy, simple, just like your deodorant should be. All right, well, that's all for me. Enjoy React. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Visual Effects Artist React. We are here with Eric Sandin. Eric is working at WEDA these days and was the visual effects supervisor on Avatar 2, Way of Water. Eric, thanks so much for being here. Hey, no worries. It's fun coming over and uh, sitting with you guys. What kind of films have you worked on? Uh, mostly little ones, uh, <laughs> Lord of the Rings, the original Avatar, King Kong, Hobbit movies. He's worked on every Lord of the Rings film, every <laughs> Hobbit film, every Avatar film, and sprinkling a half dozen other films that are all big hitters too. <laughs> so when a film like Avatar 2 comes out, where there is industry shifting technology being used, you know, that stuff doesn't happen very often. And it's just an absolute pleasure to be able to talk to one of the visual tech supervisors from the movie to learn more about the technology, for you to share all that with us. Today, he's gonna answer some questions that the internet has spent the entire last year wondering about. And I think we are finally gonna put a nail in the coffin for the shot that we've all been discussing, perhaps incorrectly, for a while now. There's a shot in the trailer where Jake is wrapping a strap around his hand, and we're all just like, whoa, because the water fidelity in that shot was just unlike anything we'd ever seen. This is the wettest water <laughs> I've ever seen. <laughs> Everything you're seeing was generated by a computer. I doubled down like three times. I'm like, no, this shot is 100% CG because I have like a biblical faith in the abilities of what it affects. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, no, that's not only possible, it's easy for them. And I said that just like out of blind faith, but then it started coming out like, oh wait, no, it's actually a little bit more complicated than that. And that started an entire debate. And so I think it's time for us to settle that debate. Let's settle this debate. Perhaps you should start with the needle. To settle the debate, we were on stage and Jim said, I can shoot with an actor for an hour on set and I can get the action I want and we can get the water, or I can f around with you guys for three months <laughs> trying to get the motion, trying to get the water, trying to get everything right. So he wanted to actually shoot it, which we did in a kiddie pool, a little plastic one. How deep was this pool? Was it like oh, literally like a foot that. deep? <laughs> And uh, we had a little buck for the Elu, or the skim wing in this case. But what we did was we shot Kevin Dorman, which is one of the actors that did the most on this entire film. We painted his hand and we did the strap. And the part we kept was about here down. Okay. And the strap around his hand and a little bit of the water in between his fingers. Everything else is CG. Oh, wow. Interesting. So not only are you here to tell us the real story, you brought with you some exclusive breakdown of the actual shot. Yeah, I haven't watched this yet. So. We have not watched this yet. No. <laughs> oh, there it is. <sighs> wow. That's so intense. <laughs> it's a lot to wow. take in over uh, 100 frames, isn't it? It's so much work. <laughs> it's so intense. Yeah, so that's how you usually see Kevin is in blue tights. <laughs> <laughs> so the paint on his arm, one of the arguments I made was that by putting paint on top of skin, you lose that sort of subsurface scattering effect and paint just doesn't quite look like real skin would. And that was my argument against it being paint on skin. Unless you paint in the subsurface feel to it. So 
the thing we did was we rendered it out and we got it to look the way we wanted it with the CG arms. And we gave it to the head of the makeup, Sarah Rubano. So she actually painted in the subsurface look for the lighting for that shot so that she got the proper color, the proper reds, all that stuff. So if you come off angle, it's not gonna work as well. Yeah, I was about to say, that's only for a very specific angle for that to work. Yeah, well, we knew what the angle was. Good point. <laughs> that, that's so I mean, crazy. Wow, okay, that actually just blew my mind more than anything. It's always a mix. It's like you can have a CG element, but if you have some practical elements, you always want to use as much of that as possible. My, I guess my point of view was that you guys already have developed some of the most incredible water simulation techniques and tool sets. And of course you already have digital copies of all the characters, all of the little items and accessories, the strap. Why shoot anything practically at all when you can already achieve that level of fidelity digitally? Performance. Okay. It's, it's just performance, right? Like, cause Jim wanted that performance that he could direct Kevin to do to get the straps tightening around. He wanted that. So uh, that's really what it comes down to, especially with Jim. Cause he doesn't doubt that we can do whatever we want and whatever he wants us to do. Um, <laughs> but he, it's, it's more about his time, right? Like how much time is it going to take him to direct that action? But yeah, the majority of it is, it's really a, a combination for both. So everyone was right in a certain way. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> now it's worth noting that the shot that we're looking at here is different than the shot that was in the teaser. Yeah, and that's the one with the blood. So yeah. in the original edit, he actually went back to that hand and you saw the blood on the hand. And that one actually didn't make the movie. Interesting. So it wasn't that the shot got replaced. It was an actual different shot that just didn't make the final cut of the movie. Yeah, it was just a different shot. Wow. Because you can actually see, like, he goes up and then dives back into the water and he gets thrown off the skim wing. And then he, like, looks at his hand and he's got some blood there. Well, you can see that blood in the teaser shot. The shot in the teaser, is that a shot where only the hand is real and everything else is CG? Or is that something where we're looking at more of a fully no, real they're, shot? No, they're both done exactly the same. So in this one, the foreground hand, the one that's squeezing, is real. The skim wing is mostly replaced. The water is mostly replaced. Yeah, because we were looking at the detail of the water on top of the actual saddle itself. The way it was going into that thin film style, glooping onto the actual saddle in a very, very realistic way. CG. <laughs> Same with those, even those bubbles there? Yeah. Wow. Because we'll, we'll, we, we had to replace the skim wing underneath. Because wow. we had to make that an actual skim wing. Because that was what I was thinking. I was like, there's a freaking creature underneath all of that. And it's too hard to like match the... Uh. It's, there's a little bit of both in there, right? Like it's all mixed. Where you can use the live action, you use it. Even if you end up projecting it back onto geometry. Um, you guys have done the same thing. One other thing we started using on this was live depth compositing with CG and live action together as you watch it. One of the weird things we weren't expecting out of that is we also get per frame geometry. Oh, wow. So we have an exact geometry for all the action and for how everything's moving. So we can do projection okay. from the live action okay. plate back onto the geometry. Okay, I want to ask a lot more about that because <laughs> that's pretty mind blowing. But let's finish looking at this first here. Okay, so we're now looking at the saddle there. And of course you guys have a digital copy of the saddle. So all of the saddle was replaced? Wait, no, the pit under his thumb is from the original yeah. also. Okay. Well, it's part replaced because the water height is different on the two. Mm. So part of it you replace, part of it you don't. And when the water is coming up on it, we have to match our CG water to it. So you project it on, you keep what you can and you put the water back over the top. It's interesting. I mean, you get like the hyper detail, like the water splashing on the hand and like on the little like surface texture of that woven pad yep. under his thumb. But then you have everything else. <laughs> <laughs> That's so intense. Because water is a very complex material in how it behaves. You know, big macro scales of this is like oceans, and then you have the tiny thin film stuff, but no solver can do each of those types of interactions all at the same time. We took all those different states, right? The big waves, the small waves, the crashing on the shore, the interaction with the boats. We taught a big system how to do that. And so it knew all the different ways to solve water and how to put it all together and how it interacts with spray and mist and like the bulk volume of it. We could simulate it all and run it all as one big pass and get all those elements for shots like this. So you do one pass for the whole thing and it gives you all the different elements, the splashes, the bubbles, all the interaction. Bubbles are a big thing, like air bubbles under the water. Is that part of the water simulation or is that a whole different type of simulation tech? It is 
part of the water simulation. You see it here, right? The interaction of the creature going into the water and it's depending on the viscosity of the water. And if the shot starts and his mouth is below the water and it moves down, you're not gonna get any bubbles. So you have to make the whole mouth go above the water, come down in, pull the small diffuse bubbles and the big bubbles and get all those interactions. You have to do a lot more thinking about the shots and what happens before the shot to get the right bubbles. But the bubbles are all, all part of the same simulation package. Yeah, because there's a, the one dude who's like underwater and he like blows out a bunch of air from his mouth and it's kind of a close up. It's just this huge like bubble shot. It's in the trailer. I just remember thinking, man, I've never been excited about bubbles since I was like <laughs> five. And here I am again. <laughs> So you have this crazy water system that can do all these different things. What's an aspect of water that it still can't do? The thing we had the hardest time with was raindrops on people because tracking a raindrop, having it hit someone's shoulder and then do a little crown splash okay. and then drip down and interact with clothes, interact with hair and things like that. And other water droplets. And other water droplets. So it combines with other water. That's honestly the thing that we struggled with the most. We hmm. figured it out in the end, hmm. but it was one of those weird things that we weren't really accounting for. But Jim had a lot of rain in this movie. It wasn't like the first movie where there were, what, one scene with rain? He used rain to help tell emotion. So we really wanted to do all these things interacting together. And like characters, you need to be able to see the hair interact with the water. You need to see the hands, the teeth. Yeah. And that's what sells the water. I feel like an unsung hero in all this is the hair. Like everybody's like, water! And the water's amazing. And it's in the name of the movie. But the hair yeah i mean it's not avatar it's the like, way of hair yeah but the hair is like perfectly photoreal and like the hair moves in the water it moves in the air and it gets wet and it dries out like you guys are doing some crazy things with the hair it's very different than the first movie first movie we did big cloth strips mm. and that would account for 20 30 hairs mm. and so that cloth strip would move around but the hairs would all sort of do this as if they're just like a texture yeah. on a piece of cloth and in this film, every individual hair is simulated on its own. On the braids, the peach fuzz on the braids is simulated. So in the wind, they all move around and you get much better performance. And you get things you wouldn't expect, like Loak. He's got that one braid, right, that is always hanging here yeah. or hanging here. And Jim always said, that's the whole reason in Terminator 2 that Eddie had that hair that always hung down onto his face. <laughs> and he wanted the same feel. There it is. Rebel yeah. feel to Okay. Me. Well, that's a cool fun fact. It's very important that you subscribe so you don't miss out when our upcoming Avatar 3 content drops. It's right around the corner, like what, four, three, four years from now? <laughs> subscribe. It's better not be. <laughs> <laughs> subscribe. <laughs> I want to talk about the motion capture because that was, I think, one performance of the performance capture. Sorry, John Lando will call you and yell at you if you <laughs> promise. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell us about the whole sort of system you developed for the way of water? Jim's first thing he said was, I want to capture everything underwater. I want to do it in one volume so that the actors can go underwater and onto the surface and out of the water and never miss a beat. So one of the guys at LEI, Ryan Champney, came up with a system where he basically did a volume underwater and a volume above water. The two were in sync and it's all one capture, which was, it was yeah. a trick in itself. Yeah, I was about to say, because the sort of challenges involved for capturing underwater versus above water are completely different. Not to mention the whole like visual refraction differences between underwater and above water. Yep, exactly like this shot here, right? You see the reflection under the surface and it screws up all your cameras. So they covered the surface in ping pong balls. Oh, wow. Uh, which essentially got rid of all the reflections under the surface and above the surface. And then you could just tie the two together. Okay, so let's, ju let's just clarify that for a quick second for everybody. So motion capture. You're tracking an object. <laughs> well, specifically... I, hear, I can feel my phone vibrating with <laughs> John already. Uh oh. Uh oh. You know you're in trouble when John calls you. Hi, John. Eric. Hi. I, I hear these rumors you're on a talk show where people are talking about stuff and calling it motion capture. It's performance capture. How did he know? I, I can't believe that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, motion capture, Eric, is missing one key letter in front of it. E. E motion capture. We want the E motion of an actor. That's why we call it performance capture. Come on. Sorry, John. Sorry, John. Eric, yeah, let's get this straight, everybody. All right, we're dialed in. <laughs>
I told you he'd know. <laughs> he always knows. I, I mean, I'm rewinding it. Go, going back even further, just the old days of tracking a ping pong ball in a space, right? So you're using optical cameras to do yep. something like that. Now, if you put up a mirror, well, that confuses the camera. Which thing is the real thing? It's the same reason you can't photo scan things that are reflected. Can't photo scan a mirror. So the surface of the water is a mirror, especially if you're below it. And so if you're trying to do performance capture in a volume and you're using optical tracking, yeah, that's just going to screw it, it all yeah, up. Yeah, it screws it all up. So in the first Avatar movie, there was a big water sequence where Jake Sully jumped off of a waterfall and went through the river. And that was all done with a process called dry for wet. Yep. Essentially, he was just hung from wires and pretended to be underwater. But that doesn't give you the same performance that you would get if you were actually underwater because there's resistance to your motion. Well, first, I'll correct you in that Jake was sitting in a office chair <laughs> with wheels getting pushed around the performance capture stage <laughs> for the first movie. <laughs> and going like this. So it was a very different experience than this Okay. <gasps> Just talking performance capture underwater, you can see it when all the characters are swimming, right? You understand that they're in the water because the way their arms are moving, the way they move around, it feels much more real. Whereas if it was dry for wet, you always get that overacting, mm -hmm. right? Like, mm -hmm. okay, pretend you're underwater. Ooh. <laughs> Everyone. I'm underwater, y'all. Yes, exactly. You don't want that. It, Jim would never let that happen. <laughs> so putting them in the water, they act like they really are. Yeah, because some of the subtlety that I'm noticing is just like the way everyone's legs from like the knees down are always kind of moving, just kind of trying to tread water a little bit. I don't think that's something that you would think of doing in a dry for wet scenario where like, oh yeah, just, just the bottoms Kicks of my, my legs are just constantly like going. Like you're saying, it's always overly exaggerated. So I got to take a moment here to give a big shout out to Weta for actually taking the time to clear clips and share behind the scenes clips with us and breakdowns to support a little YouTube show like ours and to take the time to put that out there. Like, it just it means a lot to us and it's for all of you to watch. So one big collective thank you to Weta for that. What a big deal. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Ren, cut it out. <laughs> we cannot let you bring your war here. So you mentioned that there's a new facial performance capture system for Avatar 2. And mm -hmm. instead of one camera, there's two cameras now. But how does the actual animation of these faces from that data, how has that changed? So in our old system, right, it was called a fax-based system. And we started that back on Gollum and it was hundreds and hundreds of models. We would take those models and we would blend shape and interpolate in between them, right? But sometimes in between two shapes, you got something weird. And then you had to go in and, and model those, fix those shapes and sort of try to figure out what was supposed to be in between. With our new system, it's using deep learning. It's sort of a neural net of different poses to know how the different shapes work together. So it, it figures out the muscle system and how that should react with the facial itself. Mm. So you get a much better interpolation of what the face should be doing and it doesn't use any models anymore. So it's basically going like, okay, you, you want this shape? Well, here's the muscles that would Correct. fire to give you that shape. Yeah. Wow. And then from there, it's literally just simulating the motion of those muscles underneath the skin. And then the skin is just like a shrink wrapped thing on top of it. Exactly. These shots are insane to me. I mean, all of it's insane, but like the ones where you have live action people yeah. in the scene. I mean, I don't, is the rock real? Is the rock fake? Like, you know, how much of this, like how, how did you do this? <laughs> well, actually every one of these shots is a little bit different. <laughs> so a lot of these shots, it's Jack on a green screen. This one is actually a digi double. I was about to say, for a lot of these shots, Jack could very easily just be placed in it digitally, and that helps seamlessly bring stuff together, assuming it, the camera's not too close, right? The, the problem with this one is Jim actually wanted to shoot it, but the camera would have been 10 feet outside the roof of this studio we were shooting in. <laughs> so we couldn't actually get the camera where it needed to be to get the shot. This one, we actually have Spider on a fake rock, pulling a seven foot tall guy in a blue suit. He wasn't big enough, he was really skinny. Um, so we didn't have enough volume. So what we ended up keeping was the rock and the water at the base of his feet and some of the stuff dripping off him is real, but he's actually replaced from the waist down with CG. Wait. Wow. Really? Yeah. We kept his upper half and we replaced his lower half with CG so that we could get the water 
interacting with his feet properly. <laughs> so insane. It's, it's, it's like a <laughs> weird combination for all of them, right? Like you use what you need to use and you replace what you need to replace. Jack's arm is replaced here too, so that we can get a better grip. So you have to have flawless 3D models and rendering going on to pull this off. Yes. Like, well, we, we had to have a perfect version of Jack as a CG spider. Can you describe what depth compositing is? So Jim uses Simulcam, and Simulcam is like live action and CG characters in the same shot. Right, um, okay. And as he moves the camera around, he can see the CG characters in the live action camera. That was like kind of the big pioneered sort of thing from the first Avatar. Yeah. Which was how he was able to like film live action style on a digital set. Like yeah. now we just call it virtual production. <laughs> But the downfall in the first film was if the two overlapped each other, the CG one was always gonna be just over the top. Um, you could never really put them in there properly. So in this one, we used two Basler cameras, which are just two little cameras on the side of our camera rig, and we generate depth using deep learning, and it can distinguish what is layered on top of one another, so that if Spider goes from behind Corch to in front of Corch, he shows up correctly, and even in the water, we could use our depth compositing to see what characters are layered in the water in the right depth. So in this one, you basically got where the splash was, right? And where the wave is coming in. So you could plug that into Loki, into the simulation, uh. and you could tell Loki, this is where the wave's coming in. This is the timing of the wave and get proper simulation to match the live action one. Yeah, I was about to say, that would give you like volume and velocity data. Yeah. Cool handy little things to have. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> How did you guys handle eye lines and stuff? Cause like, for a movie like this, you got all these digital people that Jack's having to like look at and they're all like twice as tall as him. Yep. Did you have the tennis ball? Um, <laughs> you know when you watch a NFL game okay. and you see that camera whizzing around the, above the, the, the cable stadium, cam the cable thing. cam? Yeah. Super cool. We set up a cable cam. It basically ran from each corner of the set and it dropped down and it had a little monitor on it with like slang space and we could plug in the performance capture of slang into the cable cam which you could then position accurately in 3d space of the actual set yeah it just did it for us because he <laughs> he acted in that same set right okay so yeah we, so it just flown above it, his head as it moved just around? moved around so when Jack was talking to Slang, he would talk to the monitor and he would have a proper eye line, proper timing. He could interact with it. If we needed him to shake hands with someone or touch someone, right? We could have um, Kevin Dorman again in a blue suit and he could just sort of walk around and look up, see where the cable cam was and just sort of walk under it and be at the right time. It would give him perfect timing. Did anyone ever get bonked in the head by the monitor? No, that was one of the biggest <laughs> worries to be honest. Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> that's first, a big danger with cable cams in general. Yeah, the first few times it got set off, everyone sort of stayed really clear of it. But it was it was very stable and it worked, uh, worked a treat. If you're enjoying this video, but you haven't got enough of it, well, guess what? There's an extended version of this episode right now on quarterdigital.com. We go into a lot more detail. We don't have to worry about algorithms or anything like like that you just it's real talk here how many years of post did you guys spend on avatar 2 official post once we stopped filming two years how about unofficial post uh seven years <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Because if you really go back, right? Like we finished the first Avatar, Jim took some time off figuring out what the next ones were gonna be. And then we got back into working with him on the uh, LEI stage and really starting to get into it. And then he started giving us test shots to start working with. So we've sort of been on and off on this for the past seven or so years. <laughs> If you guys don't win the Oscar for Best VFX, I, there's something wrong in the world. <laughs> <laughs> it's, you never know. There's some great movies out there this year, so you just never know what happens. And I think the visual effects in this movie add to the movie, which is really what you want from it, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's not a movie about visual effects like a lot of movies are. It's just a movie and it happens to have a lot of visual effects. They help add to the movie. They just aren't there to just make explosions or make weird magic things happen or whatever. So what's next for you guys, right? Like you have this crazy physics system here and you have all these crazy pieces of technology that can drive performance. What's next? What's the next egg to crack? That's always sort of an unknown, right? Like what's gonna be the next challenge? I think we've got water sort of solved, but there's new elements to the next film, which I can't unfortunately give away too much. But uh, there's new elements that we're going to have to figure out, new tricky things to make work to sell the whole film again. 
Yeah, I mean, when you're talking about all the Ewoks coming out of the, the holes in the mountains, <laughs> I mean, simulating all that's going to be crazy. <laughs> the, the, the snakes, the dinosaurs. <laughs> we'll have all those weird dinosaurs that uh, have jet packs on. <laughs> <laughs> Eric, thank you so much for joining us. It's been great being here. It's been a lot of fun. And if you ever have a question about a shot again, just give me a call. Cool. Dude, I wish I had your number last year. <laughs> that would have been would have, so much easier. Could have saved you an episode. <laughs> It <laughs> saved me a lot of people on the internet yelling how wrong I am. <laughs> and it's not motion capture, it's performance capture. Yes. And we're gonna remember that and we're gonna stick with that from here on out. Unless we're just doing motion capture, just basic motion capture. It's not John about the acting at all. You guys now, so oh, be no. careful.